Come on. What's wrong with you? All right, bye, Mom. I love you. Language is the communication of thoughts and feelings using systems of socially shared but arbitrary symbols like specific noises or uh, visual symbols. It's just none of that is inherently meaningful, but we kind of just agree on its meaning. So we definitely have to arrange these symbols according to mutually accepted rules. Now, when you study language and psychology, the kind of research you're doing is called psycholinguistics. So that's the study of how language is acquired, produced, and used. And now there's five different levels that you could look at in psycholinguistics. So the most basic level, the first level, is that of the phonemes. So phonemes are the most basic speech sounds in a language. And when I was talking earlier in, a, in a, one of the developmental psychology videos, I explained that we as parents of young children, or just when we interact with young children, we tend to use things like baby talk. Children, as a result of that, are learning the phonemes. So when we say things like, Oh, the little baby. The baby is learning things like ba ba ba. And then they'll start saying ba ba ba. It's they're demonstrating their understanding of the phonemes in your language. And because of this, uh, you know, because of the fact that phonemes come from learning about the language, different languages have different kinds of phonemes. So the most obvious example of this is that a lot of Asian cultures, a lot of Asian languages, they don't have phonemes that separate the U sound from the er sound. And that's why sometimes you'll get those stereotypical kinds of mispronunciations. So I have included a couple of uh, links to videos regarding phonemes down below. The first one just demonstrates all the different phonemes of English. So it's very, you know, scientific and kind of serious. The second one is definitely just for fun. It's an, it's an entire song that's been edited to take out all the words. So all that's left is the phonemes. You can think of it as like a phoneme song. When you start combining phonemes into meaningful units in a language, like a noun or an adjective or a verb or whatever, now we're at the second level, the morpheme level. So morphemes are the smallest grammatically meaningful units of a language. And as I just mentioned, there's many different kinds of morphemes, you know, nouns, verbs, whatever. The whole idea is you can't reduce them down any further. If you, if you try to break a morpheme down into its subparts, it will lose all meaning. So that's how you can identify what is or is not a morpheme. So here's an example. The word super is a single morpheme. You can't break that down to any smaller parts. But the word superman, that is two morphemes. You can break it down into super and man. And then you have one of the longest words in the English language, anti-disestablishmentarianism, which actually is at least six morphemes. So that would be anti disestablishment arianism the third level of psycholinguistics is syntax. So syntax refers to those rules for arranging uh, and combining words to form phrases and sentences. And these are the kinds of rules that you learn in language courses. So whenever you take your English class or your Spanish class or whatever, the majority of what you're learning is the syntax. I mean, yeah, you need to learn nouns and verbs too, but the syntax is the stuff that really takes a while to really learn, you know, things like grammar and transformational rules. The fourth level of psycholinguistics would be semantics. So now we're talking about studying the meanings in language and words, like the meanings of certain phrases or the meanings of certain kinds of statements. And there's definitely 
a lot of interesting research in into semantics. Like one of the more interesting uh, ideas that's come out of research in semantics is this linguistic relativity hypothesis. And the basic idea of the linguistic relativity hypothesis is that you know the language a person speaks helps to shape the way they perceive the world. So it's almost like if you don't have words for certain kinds of ideas, if you don't have words for certain kinds of objects, you can't really think about those things. Your brain can't process those things unless you can explain it. So I have a video just explaining more in more detail what this linguistic relativity hypothesis is all about. Make sure you check out that video. As I was saying, the linguistic relativity hypothesis allows us to, you know, kind of explain why people seem to act differently, like why we have such dramatic differences between our cultures. Like, maybe those differences can be attributed to the language people speak. Uh, because clearly, when you try to translate certain kinds of ideas from one language to another, you will sometimes, quite often actually, lose some of the meaning. So by looking at these unique kinds of differences in language between different groups of people who speak different languages, we can, I think it's fairly safe to say, we can learn a lot about those people. So here's just a few examples of words that don't exist in the English language. And maybe the fact that these words exist in other languages can tell us something about those cultures. So for example, there is a Japanese word, uh, sounds like bakushan, which refers to a beautiful girl, as long as she's being viewed from behind. Th here's a Russian term, poshe mushka, that refers to a person who asks a lot of questions. Maybe you shouldn't be asking a lot of questions if you live in Russia. Here's a Filipino term, jizel, or gijel, sorry, I don't speak Filipino. But this refers to the urge to pinch or squeeze something that is unbearably cute. Uh, you might be familiar with schadenfreude. That's a German term that refers to the pleasure that is derived from somebody else's pain. I really like this one. Here's a Gaelic term, skriob, that refers to the itchiness that overcomes the upper lip just before you take a sip of whiskey. I've also included another humorous video uh, just really kind of demonstrating the differences between people of different languages. And what you'll see when you watch this video is that some languages, when they're, when they're you know, referring to the same kind of object or event, some languages seem to be incredibly similar, but other ones, not so much. So just check out this video, but keep in mind it's, it's a comedy thing. Even though it is fairly accurate, it's still just for fun. Now the fifth and the highest level of language would be pragmatics. So pragmatics refers to those patterns of intonation and the social roles and all that other kinds of context that we need to take into account when we use language. So pragmatics focuses pretty heavily on the ways in which context, this, this kind of social environment, can contribute to our understanding of the meanings of words. Now, a lot of this research in pragmatics has been done by a, a researcher by the name of uh, Steven Pinker, and I've just included a link to him, you know, introducing the idea of pragmatics down below, so you should check that out. Besides spoken languages, we also have a lot of gestural languages. So these are languages using, you know, the body or the hands. A uh, specific one that you're probably very familiar with is sign language, and there's many kinds of sign languages. These are just languages that typically use manual gestures and body language instead of speech. So the one you're per perhaps most familiar with would be American Sign Language, which is the primary way that deaf individuals communicate in our country. But besides these kinds of sign languages, we also just naturally uh, communicate through body language. Uh, research has shown that approximately two-thirds of all communication is done through the body. So I'm talking about just, you know, how you hold yourself, your tone of voice, 
your hand gestures. Like I just naturally have my hands flailing all over the place. And that's a form of communication. You know, facial expressions and other kinds of things. Eye contact. Now the interesting thing about body language is that it is typically a more reliable indicator of a person's emotional state. And if you want to catch somebody who's lying, that the kind of body language you should pay attention to to catch a liar would actually be their tone of voice. So the tone of voice is one of the hardest things for a person to control. So when they're lying, you know, what they're saying is if it doesn't match the tone of voice, then they're probably lying. And as humans, we like to think we're special in the sense that we can communicate using our advanced linguistic skills. But it's becoming more and more clear that animals have their own ways of communicating. A many animals seem to have developed their own languages. Like dolphins have their own kinds of, you know, series of clicks and things like that. And other animals have other ways to communicate through, like, scents or certain kinds of body language, for example. Like, you know, bees will do little dances to communicate the, you know, coordinates of some patch of flowers or something like that. So I have included a couple links just demonstrating some animal's ability to communicate through what appears to be language. So you should definitely check those out as well.